Today we're going to talk with our fellow participants of the CIEE International Faculty Development Seminar from Sevilla. We are a group of faculty and administrators from various universities in the United States and we will be talking about what we learned this week in our seminar. It's been fascinating and has challenged our perspectives in meaningful ways. We've explored communication theory, Andalusian history, and photographic, video, and sound techniques which enhance sustainable narratives. We have with us Colette, Rylan, Rebecca, Caitlin, and Anilda. Hi everyone, welcome to our show. Colette will start us off. Thank you, Nancy and Ellen. So we're starting off the show with this idea of sustainable narratives and meaningful experiences. I think we would all agree that this has been a week full of meaningful experiences. Wouldn't you agree, Nancy? Absolutely. It's been both per personally and professionally rewarding in that we've learned new and intellectually challenging ideas. And um, we've had activities related to working with our students, particularly with those studying abroad. Um, I've really uh, especially appreciated the participatory and collaborative approaches to the seminar. Fantastic. I appreciated that as well. Um, also, the idea of reciprocity that we discussed on the first day as an important component of a meaningful experience, this idea of connecting to the community in a meaningful way. Anilda, how do you feel you've engaged with the community over the course of the week? Yeah, well, um, in the very first few days, it was um, sort of like interacting with the individuals that are part of the community, going to the grocery store, um, communicating with the person at the reception desk. But as the week has evolved, it has been um, a little bit more deep. Uh, yesterday, we went to El Mercado El Jueves, uh, negotiating prices and interacting with the individuals that are selling their products. So. Um, just kind of learning more about the way life goes on in Spain. That's a great observation, and I'm seeing some nodding heads, so definitely agreement around the table. Uh, one of the elements that I find memorable from the first day is this concept of kind of a frontal gaze versus peripheral gaze, or more simply put, being directly in front of an experience versus being truly within it. Uh, Rebecca, would you like to talk a little bit about how this concept maybe resonated with you? Sure. Um, I think that it was interesting to think about sort of being in front of a perspective versus being in an experience um, because we are ourselves faculty studying abroad. So we're thinking about um, bringing our students to have meaningful experiences, but we're also having them here ourselves um, and thinking about how media sort of bringing media into that experience can shape it as well. So um, framing your experience with a camera lens or um, injecting uh, recording into an exchange that you're having with a person, sort of um, the ways that that can change an experience and how to mitigate against that to keep it authentic was something that, um, that I struggled with this week. And I think that's a good struggle to have and something to bring to our students as well. Absolutely, that's a great point. We ended the day on our first day with a discussion about storytelling and the hidden patterns in every story and this kind of Western concept of a linear plot with action and a climax and a resolution and how there can be these stories present in our daily lives um, and in our, in our local communities. Caitlin, you had a particularly compelling story of a, a true superhero in, in your life. I did. I did indeed. So uh, to make a long story short, back in 2008, just like in Spain, there was a economic crisis in the United States as well. And um, by, by virtue of a position, a job that I had working very, very closely <coughs> with the Hispanic community, particularly migrant workers and undocumented workers, um, I, was, I, I was in a unique position to help a lot of people get jobs and improve their lives in a period of time that was very, very challenging economically. And um, at that moment, uh, my husband actually lost his job. And one of the individuals who I, who I worked with for a very long time and had become very, very close with her and her family, she knew a little bit about what was going on, the struggle and, and how difficult it was. Um, and she actually managed to get my husband a job at the migrant farm. And so he became a migrant worker himself and worked in the fields. and. And, and it was a huge surprise. Surprise! She didn't. She didn't ask. She didn't tell us. She just showed up at our house one evening and said, well, "You know, we'd like." Yeah, I, I spoke with, with the supervisor and was able to get your husband a job. Would he like to do it? So it was pretty incredible. It was a, it was a total inversion of roles. She became 
our superhero. Such a powerful story. It's clear that our first day was jam-packed with interesting concepts, um, and the rest of the week has been as well. We'll turn now to Inilda to continue the conversation. Okay, so we are now going to move on to talk about uh, the second day in the seminar. Uh, this day we work with uh, Miguel Romero and Antonio Perez, uh, some of our uh, local civil artists, uh, who challenge in a way how we represent reality visually. Uh, one of the main ideas during the workshop that we had uh, was that um, we like to construct our very own reality. Um, Raylan, why do you think we default to constructed images? Um, I, I think that it is a learned behavior that um, we learn very early um, developing um, in, uh, as, as young children. Um, and I feel that it's, um, it's used in context uh, in society and is, you know, interpreted as you smile to have a pretty picture. Um, so I think the constructed images are default by the learned behavior from very early on and are brought into context by um, society and what we have been taught. Yeah, great point. Um, now, we spent the entire day with Miguel and Antonio. Um, Ellen, what would you say uh, were some of the gains? Uh, what were you able to capture from um, this interaction, this experience that we had with Miguel and Antonio? Well, I, I think that Miguel and Antonio are both extremely inspiring teachers of photography. And what impressed me so much was how they think, live, and create within their subject matter. Um, they are right inside the image as they're creating it. And I thought that was so, so unique to see and, and get an understanding of that process. Um, I, I also think that they're, the way they both uh, photograph people was very, very unusual. They have a, an exceptional level of intimacy with people and they're able to project such authentic human experience. Thank you, Ellen. And two words um, that I get from, from what you just mentioned is creation and capturing. And with that, I, I want to go to um, this activity that, that we did, which was one of my favorite activities, and it was so unique, uh, which was the creation of our very own personal camera oscura. Um, using what, two boxes, um, a lens, a piece of paper, and then voila, we have our very own camera. Becca, did you enjoy this activity? And how did it feel walking around, taking pictures with the camera oscura? How did it affect your reality? Mm -hmm. Well, I think this was a really interesting experience and it was challenging too, um, creating the camera and then taking it around the city. It was actually pretty destabilizing the process of capturing images because um, the way a camera works, which we forget when we only use our iPhone, is that it's a reflection and it's inverse and it's opposite. And so when we were uh, trying to film video and then take photos with this um, device that we've created, uh, up is down and left is right. And so capturing the images was sort of challenging and it could be frustrating at times because you'd see like a dog walking through the park and you're trying to follow the dog the dog's going right and um you have to actually move the camera to the left <coughs> which was uh frustrating and confusing but um there was something about then seeing the images after um that was really interesting and and looked not like more real but was really different sort of an interesting filter and so <coughs> I enjoyed it although at times it was um, definitely challenging yeah and and then we got back um, to Sikus and then we're kind of 
uh, deconstructing what we have, the pictures that we've taken, and we're kind of giving our reality um, as we're going um, we're, we're going through the experience again. Um, of course, I do not want to overlook our visit to the Camera Oscura in the Torres de Perdigones. Uh, what a view from the top. Um, it just gave me a really unique perspective of the city. Um, I, I don't know if you all felt this way, but as I was looking at the um, images that was being shown, I, I started creating a different reality of Seville, which was um, kind of represented by our tour guide, Jose Miguel, because he was providing a visual tour using the camera oscura, but he also was providing information and facts, and he was integrating his own narrative about the city, about the buildings, the areas, and the landscape, which I thought was just fantastic. Perhaps one of the most illuminating days was the third day, particularly in thinking about how we're sort of suckers for communication consumption, particularly in the United States and particularly in the 21st century. Um, we discussed the obstacles and the issues and the problems that come up when we, when we try to really represent culture, whether that's in pictures or film or literature, really any way that we try to capture and convey what culture is. It's so easy to be manipulated by, by narrative, the idea of narrative, since narrative images and sounds and words are so often produced and distributed with a calculated purpose in mind. And that could be anything from political to economic to social. And, and really, things aren't often what they seem to be, or more importantly, what we, what we learn them to be. So I'm really curious, Rebecca, did any of the cultural, historical examples that we discussed on the third day, did they surprise you in, 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 in particular? Yeah, I think um, I really enjoyed um, the historian Emilio. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I enjoyed yeah. Emilio's um, like re-presentation of uh, Spanish history, sort of, uh, <coughs> again, um, sort of decentralized instead of thinking about like there was more Spain and then there was Christian Spain. Um, it was really interesting to see the way he used literature and primary documents and the way his facility with uh, languages, not just Spanish, but also Arabic and probably classical languages as well. Um, were able to give him sort of a more complex um, understanding of Spanish history. Uh, I really enjoyed that and found it <coughs> fascinating. Absolutely, absolutely. It was it was incredible how he deconstructed to reconstruct a history that's that's so pervasive. Uh, kind of in the national collective identity and things like that. So um, in terms of our students and bringing this back into what we actually do working at universities, Inilda, what obstacles does representing culture, that, ki that idea of trying to represent culture, wh what obstacles does that present for our students? Well, our students have been raised in their own culture. And they have, a, as you have been saying, uh, they have been consuming other cultures based on the filter um, that is presented to them, mm -hmm, you know, um, by others, by media, um, by their education. And they have to kind of break through, you know, that facade and really dig deep to understand culture. And, and for them, it may mean culture as a stereotype, and they don't truly understand the meaning of culture as to um, there's a local culture, there is 
um, a more international culture, uh, specifically uh, speaking of Spain. So, so breaking through and digging deep, I think those are challenges that they have. Of course, they also have the challenge of time. They're only here for a certain amount of time. So, um, it, you know, those are difficulties that they have to overcome. Absolutely, absolutely. So Nancy, how can we better enable them to tackle those problems, to not fall into the trap? Well, I think it really relates to this idea. I think it really relates to this idea of um, understanding culture. But uh, where I teach, um, I'm, I teach in an Appalachian area, and I think that culture itself is very rich. So perhaps we can have our students explore their own culture or cultures that they are um, they grew up with that they currently um, have access to, and um, and really take a peripheral gaze from that culture cultural perspective really go deep and participate in the culture rather than look at it from the outside. Mm. And as they develop that skill in doing that in the place that they grew up in their own culture, those that way of looking that might be different could um, transfer to their experience as they travel abroad. Mm -hmm. But I think, again, what I'll take back to my university is this idea of that um, actively participating and experiencing a culture from within rather than um, looking at it from the outside. Absolutely, absolutely. I think that's very well said. Um, Colette, I'm curious because you work with a student demographic that's very different from Nancy. So what do you think? Do you agree? Do you disagree? Um, I think there, there are elements of that for sure. The thing that often we find ourselves kind of expecting and, and we try we need to avoid is this idea that if we just send students abroad they're going to they're going to get it. They're going to understand culture because they've had this experience abroad, and, and that's simply not the case. Um, there needs to be that intentional reflection and kind of set up before they go, as well as while they're there and when they return, and having the faculty who are there to help them through that process, having um, the staff members there when they return to kind of help students think through their experience and kind of articulate it then at the end. And, and then this other concept of time, you know, how long are the students there? How much can we expect them to gain from the different types of programs? And how do we shift the conversation if it's a two week program versus if our student is there for six months or if they're there for a full academic year? Because they're going to have different experiences and be involved in that culture in a, in a different way. And so it's kind of, on all sides, you know, before they go, while they're there, when they return, how do we help them both as faculty members and as administrators to really come to a, a more enriched understanding of, of what that culture really is? Great, great. Thank you. Four of our CIE International Development um, Faculty Development Seminar, we explored um, the idea that information is not communicated and that context is everything. Anita, could you explain what the difference is between information and communication? Um, for me, information is passive, is um, content that is presented to an individual. Whereas communication is an active, um, you know, situation where there is a context, um, there is a sender, and there is a receiver, and then there is like an acknowledgement of received um, a received message. So I guess in my words, those those are the difference between information and communication. Right, so that information is passive and that communication is really the experience and the action behind that. 
Um, so the definition of information is things that are provided or learned about something or someone, while the definition of communication is the exchange of information and the means of doing so. Um, both information and communication share a topic, the, the something or the someone, and both are dependent on the context. And we really learned that the context really means um, how that experience is going to uh, be reflected. Um, information can be true or false based on the context that is communicated in. For example, if I, um, if I give the information of it is time for lunch, but the context is that it is dark outside, this makes it difficult for the audience to accept the information as true or um, or therefore it could be factual information. This communication um, can be proven false in that, in that retrospective. Um, during our time in Sevilla on day four, we toured two markets, El Corte Inglés, um, and, and or, excuse me, El Corte Inglés supermarket and the flea market of El Huevos. Um, Huevos. Uh, both were markets, but the context of the two were vastly different. The communication of information was dependent on the context that it was found. For example, prices in El Corte Inglés supermarket were set and could be found next to the product in question. In El Hueves, the prices were not displayed and allowed for bargaining to take place. Much more communication was needed. Two very different contextual places creating different types of communication and um, that creates vastly different information. All right, so as you can see, we've all learned a lot this week. Um, I think it'll be great for us to take some time to reflect on how um, our experiences here can shape our work in the classrooms, in our program development, and also in our lives. So I'd like to start by thinking about our classroom practices. Um, and I'd like to start with you, Nancy, because you teach teachers. Um, so how do you think you'll share what you've learned here with your education students? Um, well, from the beginning to the end, it has just been a rich experience. I've been thinking at every moment how the the theoretical as well as the practical information it just perfectly fits into what I'm teaching teachers about um, the idea of openness about participation collaboration being a part of fully um, to the extent that that you can be because I think this is these are all qualities teachers need to have um, in addition the activities that have related to photography and sound and video um, are topics that I cover in my digital literacy class with with um, uh, elementary, middle, and secondary um, secondary and, and special education students, and so again um, the 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 activities that we've done with the, the camera obscura with the sound design um, I think has relevance for my students in the in the college classroom and then eventually in the K twelve classroom when they become uh, future teachers. Oh, that's great. Thanks. Um, I'd also like to ask Ellen specifically, Ellen, as a professional fashion photographer and a teacher of photography, um, what do you think you'll bring back into the classroom? Uh, I, I think a number of things, actually. Um, I love the exercise with the camera obscura. I traditionally, in my history of photography classes, have had the students create a whole room that was a camera obscura. But I think in the future, I'm going to supplement creating the room with the personal cameras as well. Um, it was such a wonderful tactile experience to understand how the camera works and then the relevance with the iPhone photography I think really brings it back to to our time today. So it mm -hmm. sort of makes a big leap in terms of years of photography. Um, also what impressed me so much, um, one of the things that I struggle with with students is getting them to understand what portrait photography is and understand the expression of the interior of someone as, a, as opposed to just the exterior. And the way that Antonio has such a gift with people and the way he was able to make people comfortable and express their authentic selves I thought was really rich. I mean, some of his techniques I think I'm going to use. Um, 
the firecracker thing. I don't know if I'll use a firecracker or <laughs> uh, Antonio did some portraits where he would bring the people into his um, studio and they wouldn't know what was going on and he would start to photograph and he would intentionally set off some firecrackers which would really surprise them. And so the images were all about their different reactions um, to this unexpected event. And I thought that that was so wonderful to really get an authentic human experience mm -hmm. with that technique. Yeah. Totally. He also did that with us with the, he made us balloon pop, pop balloons. <laughs> exactly. So I think we're going to see what our own authentic experiences are soon <laughs> enough. Um, on a broader scale, I think some of us are here um, to learn tools that we can apply to our program development. I know that I uh, direct an honors program for gifted, talented, um, driven students that have self-selected. And uh, I'm thinking about some of the ways that I can instill those skills into my students. But I'd love for Colette to share some of the uh, tools and techniques that she'll bring back to Georgia Tech because they have such an interesting um, international plan. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. I think with my students, because they are this kind of unique subset, they are learning a foreign language, they are going abroad for a minimum of six months, two countries that correspond with the language that they're studying, and they're tying that all together within their major field of study, whether that's mechanical engineering or computer science or business. And so these students are, are having these very rich experiences, but they're not necessarily understanding what their personal narrative is and what the narrative of that experience is. And I think one of the, the things I'm absolutely going to take away and kind of implement with my students is um, kind of a digital storytelling workshop before they go so that they can kind of understand maybe what they should be thinking about and processing and then they go out into the world and have these incredible experiences mm -hmm. and then when they come back to really be able to reflect on that experience in a little bit of a more meaningful way but also to create kind of a final product that allows them to articulate that narrative that they've kind of culminated and created and experienced um, hopefully in a very rich meaningful way mm -hmm. while they've been abroad. Yeah as an English professor I really appreciate how you're giving uh, mechanical engineering students access to narrative right yes. I think uh, <laughs> in, in we the do liberal what we can. Arts, <laughs> yeah in the liberal arts we sort of live our lives in narrative and I think everyone does but uh, but the students in the hard sciences don't always have the same access to that um, opportunity for metacognition so that's really cool um, I think Anilda I'd like to turn to you now because um, you are thinking about designing study abroad for your graduate students and I think uh, I wish that when I was a grad student I had the opportunity to study abroad so I'd love to hear what you're thinking going forward so um, I teach in an instructional design and technology program and in instructional design we actually borrow significantly from the communication field and uh, we use we integrate some of the theory uh, that, that that's using communication so what I want to do is actually integrate some of the knowledge that we have acquired through this week and inter incorporate them into my multimedia class and have an international component to that multimedia class uh, for graduate students because um, programs for international education um, have a significant number of undergraduate, there's a significant number of undergraduate programs, but there isn't really an outlet for graduate students. And of course, I have my passion for instructional design and I want my students to have that experience. So um, that's what I would like to do uh, for them. And then they can integrate um, this multimedia component, communication and international component into their uh, professional portfolios before they graduate and go on to the world and, and look for jobs. So that's what I would really like to do um, as I you know, think about the things that we have done this week. Great. And finally, I'm going to do that annoying thing that I'm always asking my students to do, which is uh, think about sort of the real world applications outside the classroom, outside of the university. And um, Caitlin, I'd love to ask you, what are some of the real world implications that you think this, um, this experience will have um, 
set on you and also on your students? I think it's such an important question to ask and to reflect on, and particularly with the students who I work with, because I, I teach Spanish and, and Latin American studies in the United States, and it's such a, such a controversial topic depending on where you are in the country. And, you know, my students, our students, they, they live in the real world. They, they must be able to navigate the real world and kind of be able to decipher what is real and what is a construction. And, and to really be able to, to parse the noise and, and go deeper. I think that that's a set of skills that does not come naturally to students. And I think that this course in particular has given me a, a much different perspective of how to prepare students to do that. Um, so, you know, parsing the noise, going deeper, they can challenge themselves by challenging those narratives that are drilled into us from a very young age, and whether that's elementary school laying the foundation with national history or being a teenager and being sort of the target demographic for clothes and music and everything that's cool or even us as adults about to participate in an election that is already very controversial, very polemic, and, and not going in a very good direction. I and think shaped that it's, by its own narratives. And shaped right? by its own narratives. And so even, even for us in all those very different situations, different ages, it, it is so important to develop a set of skills to, to know really what you're looking at and to, and to have the, the mindset, the open mind to consider that there might be alternative options and truths. Definitely. And um, finally, I want to turn to Rylan because Rylan is uh, employed by CIEE and one of the organizations or one of the programs that she's in charge of promoting is the International Faculty Development Seminars. And I think um, as teachers, we don't or I didn't become a teacher because I liked to teach. I became a teacher because I really liked to learn. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just want to ask Rylan, um, how do you think uh, your experience in the seminar will sort of shape the way that you talk about international faculty development seminars um, and the way that you promote them? Sure. Thank you, Becca. Um, so absolutely, this experience and seminar has completely shaped um, my overall view and um, context of education. And um, I've really brought from this the importance um, when promoting, promoting CIE um, International Faculty Development Seminars, the importance of bringing um, the context of education um, and educational enrichment um, into uh, the marketing and the promotion of CIE International Faculty Development Seminars. I think I've learned a lot in context, um, being surrounded by uh, six, you know, uh, highly professional educational women and. Um, learning how the process of learning and theory and context really can be related back to my marketing practice at CIE. Awesome. Thank you. Well, um, I think I'm going to turn it back over to our lovely hosts, Nancy and Ellen. Um, vale, 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 vale. Y le hace un agujerito por aquí. No, y, y lo le tapas. Le más chico, más foco tiene. Sí. Y ahora, y ahora mira. Mira, mira, mira. Mira, mira. Y se ve, lo que pasa es que se ve al revés. Ah, bien. Se ve al revés. Bueno, vale, se ve, pero se ve la proyección. Hola. Poco abajo, pero no se ve. Hola. No, pero. Hola. So I, I think it's fair to say that we've all had an amazing experience together and with our hosts and we just wanted to thank everyone for their insights today and a heartfelt thanks to Oscar, uh, our fabulous seminar leader, all the other teachers involved in the program and of course CIEE for their time and expertise and it's been such a well-planned and academically rich study abroad experience for all of us. Absolutely, and we've learned so much. We've had these incredible experiences, and I think maybe we could all agree that we've had this opportunity to meet an amazing city, Sevilla. Mm -hmm. So let's end our show with a quote from Italo Calvino about the city. The city, however, does not tell its past. 
but contains it like the lines of a hand written in the corners of the streets, the gratings of the windows, the banisters of the steps, the antenna of the lightning rods, the poles of the flags, every segment marked in turn with scratches, indentations, scrolls.